some of the impacts of global warming. Well, um, the IPCC, the International Panel of Climate something, I forget, um, they ultimately resulted in the generation of the Kyoto Protocol to help reduce greenhouse gases. But some of their predictions of the future, you can see them here. Um, sea levels rising, we've all heard that. Altered ecosystems, yes. Um, increased droughts, temperature rising. And we're going to take a look at some things that we're actually seeing. So these are just predictions, but what are we actually seeing nowadays? We are seeing an effect on polar ice. 1953 to 19 to 2000, polar ice used to be much bigger. It has since shrunk to the size that we see here in the green. Oh, and then in the blue. So we know it's shrinking. That's a fact. Actual ice sheets used to be five times taller than shown here, by the way. We see that Arctic sea ice area is declining. This is just another way of showing what we just said. And another graph. Antarctica is losing land ice. That ice is melting into the sea, therefore raising sea levels. And the Arctic sea ice area is the lowest in the satellite era. So as long as we've been able to measure it, it is now at its lowest. Less ice also in Greenland. And here we see um, this is a model simulation, same deal, but they're predicting from this model that Arctic sea ice might be gone by 2085. Let's remind ourselves about positive feedback loops. As the um, temperature warms up, sea ice cover melts and shrinks. Ocean waves absorb more solar radiation than the highly reflective sea ice. So less reflection, more absorption, temperatures warm, more sea ice melts and shrinks, and then more absorption, less reflection, causing increased temperature change, and it's a runaway effect. What's the effect on glaciers? Glaciers are losing ice worldwide. Here is a glacier. This is Grinnell Glacier in Montana, 1938. 1981, we're looking at this part right here, 1998 and 2009, it has receded significantly. And here's some different glaciers, we're seeing them all decreasing. What's the effect on oceans? Ocean heat content is exceeding the long-term average. Oceans are warming. And as they are also absorbing more dissolved carbon dioxide, making their pH drop, becoming more acidic, because more CO2 means more carbonic acid in the ocean. We are seeing in this diagram as well that decrease in pH in these areas. Is anybody experiencing a increase in pH, meaning more basic? No. These are all greens, yellows, and oranges effect on coastal areas. Rising sea levels in re relation to global warming is mostly due to which of the following? This is multiple choice. You might be surprised at the answer. It is thermal expansion of the ocean water. As it heats up, it expands. And melting polar ice, that does have some effect, but a small effect. Melt melting glaciers also has a smaller effect. The one, that, the one thing that has no effect is the melting of icebergs. And here we can see global mean sea level change. It has definitely gone up by a few millimeters per year. It is now rising at the fastest rate on record, however. And sea levels are rising, so all these coastal areas are going to be affected, losing their homes, losing some of the estuaries and wetlands surrounding the coasts. And you can see here that a 51 centimeter, half, an in, half a meter sea level rise would inundate wetlands in red and drylands in orange on all U.S. coasts. This is what it would be like for Santa Barbara if the, if the sea level went up by 7 meters. That's a lot. But let's just say what would happen? All of downtown practically would be covered in ice. I mean, covered in water. What's the effect on seasons? Winters have warmed faster than summers. So we are seeing more record-setting days in the winter than we are record-setting days in summer. 
From 1948 to 2002, western snow fields are melting up to 20 days earlier. What we mean by that is um, snow seasons are not, or ski seasons are not as long as they used to be. And we also know that less snow is covering in, in the northern hemisphere. There's also less frozen ground, meaning permafrost is thawing. The number of days without frost, and that indicates growing season, is increasing, meaning that growing seasons are coming on uh, earlier in the year. And um, this is just some more things about timing of spring snowmelt. Um, it's becoming a little bit, um, let's see here. Um, well, I'm not sure about this one. But wildfires, we're seeing um, fire season length, longer wildfire seasons. And wildfire frequency has increased um, pretty remarkably since the mid-80s. We've certainly seen that in Santa Barbara. And temperature red and wildfires in black are growing in Canadian forests. So we're seeing a correlation between temperatures and wildfires. What are the effect on species? Well, we see U.S. plant zones shifting. Whereas in 1990, um, we had these um, plants in green, whatever that, whatever zone it is. So zone basically means what kind of a plant um, does that favor. Those zones have shifted up because you have to go further north to retain the same um, cooler temperatures that you preferred. Predicted U.S. impacts, forest type changes. So this is the, um, these are just showing how some trees are going to be migrating. And we can, to point that out, basically, let's just pick these blues. They kind of stand out, right? These blues are the um, shortleaf pine. And they are migrating up here to higher um, latitudes further north. Or we can take the, the reds here. They're also migrating further north. Also, the effect of global warming on animal species. For um, the percent of all animal and plant land species facing extinction in selected areas, we can see that a lot more of them are facing extinction. If they can move to warmer areas, they do. If they can't move, they don't, and they end up going extinct. We see changes in mating and flowering seasons. These are all coming on earlier. Flowering is sparked by warmer temperatures as we come out of the winter season. So this is in um, change in spring timing in days per decade. And here we see species are climbing northward or upslope. We see bird, butterflies, and herbs. Um, more of them are going either north or upslope um, than they have been. So, bottom line is, species are migrating, but they can only go so far. Here's a quote from Nature Magazine 2004. We predict that by 2050, 15 to 37 percent of species will be committed to extinction, meaning they can't migrate any farther, they just die off. And this is be one million species, but countless individuals. One million species. Our species suffers too. We have more deaths from summer heat waves. These um, have been increasing. As you can see here, um, 1964 to 1991 in orange and in red, well, it's estimated 2020. Reducing greenhouse gases. So this would be the solution. We can do that by a more efficient generation and usage. We can do that by um, renewable energy. Let's just go back for a moment here. We can try to use cleaner burning coal. Um, you know, coal, how we like it or not, is going to put out CO2. So the question is, how do we try to capture some of that CO2 and sequester it, which means grab it and stick it somewhere, store it underground, for example. Or better energy conservation, not leaving lights turned on. Improve technology at plants. Make them more efficient so that you get more electricity produced for every pound of coal that you're burning. Renewable energy, this is kind of a no-brainer, right? Energy that doesn't produce CO2 because you're not burning anything. 
Transportation. This is the second largest source of greenhouse gases. One third of the average U.S. city is devoted to cars. And average U.S. home family makes 10 car trips per day, $200 million per day on road construction and repair. The number of cars in the U.S. will soon exceed the number of people. More cars than people. We can try to make our cars more efficient. We do that with hybrid vehicles. Um, we're doing it with electric vehicles where we can have greater efficiency because you can make electricity at the power plant more efficiently than you can in your car. Um, so you can, let's just take a look at some of these losses just for a moment. This is kind of a preview into our next unit. Of all the energy you're putting in in the form of gasoline, only 14% of it goes into moving the car. So um, you're, you have this, um, this is called the 62% engine heat loss, friction, efficient, inefficiencies, things like that. Then you have idling. Then you have 5%, and by the way, idling means the car's turned on, but you're not actually driving. And then you have 5% due to friction in the drivetrain, like in the gears, and 2% running accessories like your water pump, your stereo, things like that. So let's bike and walk more, eh? That way we don't need as much oil from Saudi Arabia. Even nowadays, every single day in the U.S., we're using 20 million barrels of oil. And this would um, this is showing public transportation. These vehicles emit 90% less CO and VOCs and nearly 50% less NOx and CO2 as private vehicles. That's huge. We should be driving, riding buses more or trains. Which of the following was a policy or law designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions? I think you know this one. Kyoto Protocol. You should know it from assignment 9.4. And um, <clears throat> so. There were some, some shorter efforts earlier on, 1992. You don't really need to know about that one. It was an epic fail. 1997, you had the Kyoto Protocol, and you should know this one. It means by 2012, we reduced greenhouse gases to below 1990 levels, but that's the goal. We obviously haven't gotten there, but there has been some success. Some greenhouse gases have been reduced. Many countries have done reasonably good jobs with that. There's nothing like, and that can be penalized if you don't, but it's kind of a universal agreement. And you can see some of the required changes, some of the observed changes. Russia, yeah, go Russia. Um, U.S. actually saw an increase in our emissions. We did not sign the Kyoto Protocol, by the way. Canada also, big changes. It was ratified by 191 nations, enough to make it binding. So I guess they all agree that if enough nations agree, we will all agree to follow it. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to have some debates after AP tests, so this is probably a nice one to debate about. Precautionary principle, though, should we be reducing? If, um, so some people say we should in that slowing down our economy to try to reduce CO2 emissions will impede innovation and economic growth. Other people say, yeah, but the stakes are too high to gamble with our climate. This is a good discussion for after AP. What is the verdict? Well, let's just say this. 33 national science academies believe global warming is true. 68 national and international science organizations believe global warming is true. 97% of active climate scientists believe global warming is true. When we say global warming is true, we mean that it is truly due to human activity. Of all the peer-reviewed climate articles between those years, um, almost all of them, only 24 reject global warming out of the almost 14,000. So just want to point out that in this country, more than other countries, we give a lot of weight to those dissenting opinions. We might, when I, by, when I say weight, I mean we might give roughly equal airplay to those few scientists who have opposing viewpoints. And so it might seem like there's a strong consensus out there, but it's actually the voice of a few getting magnified by many television minutes. So the Stanford poll questioned the people, if nothing is done to prevent it, do you think the world's temperature probably will go up slowly over the next 100 years? And most think that, yes, it will go up. Percent saying global warming is the single biggest environmental problem the world faces today. Um, the majority of people, well, actually, sorry, we can see this changing over time, where not as many people are thinking that it is the single biggest environmental problem the world faces today, which is an interesting trend because it seems to be a pretty serious problem, but maybe people are just kind of burned out. Who knows? We'll talk. 
And other questions. If nothing is done to reduce global warming, how serious of a problem do you think it will be for the United States? A lot of people think very serious. How much do you think or should we should do about global warming? A lot of people think we should do a great deal about it. So are we? How much do you trust what scientists say about the environment? Um, now, we, we see less than we did um, five years before. So people aren't having as much say and trust about the scientists say. Interesting. Here's kind of my take on it, everybody. What if it's a big hoax and we created a better world for nothing? When we talk about reducing CO2 emissions, we talk about burning fewer fossil fuels and using more renewable energy. Remember about fossil fuels. We need them for other things besides just energy. We use oil to make plastic. We use natural gas to make plastic. We use coal to make steel and materials like that. So we should be saving these things for other uses as well. There was a big march. Oh, this was the 1963 March on Washington, the Civil Rights March. This is the 1970s Vietnam protest. This was the February 2013, 40,000 people forward on climate. So my question to you is, which rally will you be participating in the coming future? All right, talk to everyone in class.